Good morning. Welcome to Austin, Texas, and welcome to South by Southwest EDU. It's fantastic to see all you guys and gals and non-binary pals here today. Thanks so much for joining us. South by EDU hosts an inclusive community, and we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to see all y'all here. Thank you. Um, we're excited for uh, the next four days of learning together and still more days of fun and learning as South by Southwest music, film, and interactive continue. So again, welcome. I'm Ron Reed, and it's been my privilege the past 13 years to open up the South by EDU conference and welcome y'all. Um, when my colleague Greg Rosenbaum and I started South by EDU in 2011, we had a goal of growing a community like you, of passionate innovators really committed to improving the world through learning. We've made good progress and we're pleased with how South by EDU has grown and matured. In many ways, I feel like South by EDU has indeed grown into its roots as a South by Southwest experience. It's truly a convergence event, bringing together a wide variety of stakeholders to have a sincere and authentic conversation about improving teaching and learning. South by EDU has intentionally placed ourselves at the intersection of culture and learning, which I'm here to tell you is a pretty busy intersection these days. South by Southwest model of putting everybody around the table to chart a smart and creative path forward is what fueled the growth of South by Southwest music, South by Southwest film, and South by Southwest interactive. And we're pleased that with South by EDU, education has become one of South by Southwest's four principal verticals, joining film, music, and technology. Welcome to South by Southwest EDU. Over the, over the past few years, society has become a lot more aware and engaged in your important work as educators, and with good reason. It provides the foundation for personal growth and fulfillment for professional development and distinction and to connect us to a broader citizenry with a shared vision of a better, more equitable, and just tomorrow. Greg and I and the entire EDU team honestly believe, immodestly, that South by EDU will ultimately become the largest community South by Southwest supports, that learning will be the organization's largest vertical. What else, other than education, provides the foundation for all the intellectual and creative pursuits we come together to celebrate. At, at South by EDU, I'll share we've not yet achieved our ambition to be the world's largest learning festival, but you should know that's our goal, to champion you and your work in support of a quickly evolving planet and society. The day after we wrap up uh, EDU, South By is gonna register another 30 or 40,000 registrants for the music, film, and tech conference. The organization has the scale. This community merits the support and attention, and the world is hungry and in need of smart and intentional solutions. So I say thank you again for being here. Uh, we believe your work's super important, so let's get started. Um, to introduce our opening speaker, I'm pleased to invite my friend and colleague and the co-founder of South by EDU, a spectacular leader who really embodies everything great about South by to the stage to introduce our opening speaker. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Greg Rosenbaum, Managing Director for South by Southwest EDU. Thank you all. Thanks, Ron. Uh, it's been a joy and an honor to work alongside you and the whole South by Southwest EDU team to support the growth of this community and the event. Welcome uh, to South by Southwest EDU. Today, as we kick things off, it's a real privilege to introduce our opening keynote, Luma Moufle. As I shared with Luma a couple weeks ago in preparation for today's keynote, the passion, the vision, and community-centered approach she has employed throughout her journey makes her a truly inspirational leader and will set the tone for the next four days. Luma is a social entrepreneur and the founder of the Fuji's family, the only network of schools in the United States dedicated to refugee and immigrant education. Her journey as a school founder, yeah, yes. Her
Her, her journey as a school founder started on the soccer field as she coached her team, the Fugees, with players coming from 28 war-torn countries. I look forward to learning from Luma, both about her journey and how we can better serve communities across America and around the world. Uh, before we jump in, a quick reminder that uh, well, there'll be a Q&A portion for this keynote. You can find in the Engage button in the South by Southwest EDU Go app to engage, so please submit your questions and upvote there. Luma will also be doing a book signing of her book, Learning America, One Woman's Fight for Educational Justice for Refugee Children, following this keynote at 11.30 on level three in the Austin Convention Center. Please join me in welcoming Luma Mufle to the stage. Good morning. Sabah al khair. Mnih anna nas hon bitkallamu arabi. Liom rah nibda bdars al riyadiyat. Dars al talit liom bikon al qism. Fahmanin ashram bhaki? Fi an ditnin fahmanin hon. Ma tatu hom kill al ajwabi. Tayyib? Fa za anna bna nasam liom. Kam adad al mozat anna hon. كم واحد؟ واحد، اثنين، ثلاثة في حدا بيعرف؟ كم واحد؟ ثمانية، فعنا ثمانية هون اليوم بدنا نقسم هون كم ناس عنا هون؟ كم شخص فيه؟ أربعة كم عدد النساء هون؟ اثنين فإذا بدنا نقسم ثمان موزات على اثنين، قد إيه بيصيروا؟ أربعة. Now don't panic. You did not sign up for an Arabic immersion session. You just experienced a two minute elementary math lesson in a language that you are not familiar with. How did that make you feel? Imagine having to do that for 360 minutes a day, as millions of English language learners in this country do every single day. This is the problem I spent the last 20 years trying to figure out. I didn't start out wanting to work in education. I was just a soccer coach, trying to help the kids I was coaching, kids from refugee families who were going to schools that didn't know how to meet their needs. As a coach, I would never throw a player into a game who didn't know the basics of soccer. That would be setting them up for defeat, for humiliation, and for failure. But at school, the kids I coach were being placed in algebra even though they didn't know how to add. Kids who couldn't recognize any letters of the alphabet were asked to read Shakespeare. Kids were being passed through the school system not because they were learning, but because administrators and educators didn't know what to do with them. They were trying to fit them into a system that was not designed to meet their needs. Change a few details about their story, and that could have been me. My story didn't start out with setting out to try and change the educational system. It didn't even start off with coaching. It started, in a way, with Dolly Parton. <laughs> you heard that right, Dolly Parton. As a kid, I really, really loved her. I still do. I remember seeing her in 9 to 5, this little lady with big boobs, tying her boss up. As a kid growing up in Amman, Jordan, I just loved it. But in all seriousness, that image of Dolly taking matters into her own hands and changing things really stuck with me. When I was old enough, I traveled to the United States for college. Being at Smith made me feel excited and alive and free, to be me w and free to be me in ways that I've never experienced before. During the spring of my senior year, as my classmates were finishing up applications to grad schools and going on job interviews, I was going on a different type of interview. I was preparing for my asylum hearing, the hearing that would determine whether or not I could remain in this country. I'm gay and Arab and Muslim. In soccer, we call that a hat trick. 
Oh, and my wife is Jewish, so let's just top it off with that. <laughs> In the Middle East, we call that a crime, punishable by death. I knew that I could never go back. So that summer after my senior year, I was granted asylum. The moment was bittersweet. I lost my family, my home, my country, but I gained my freedom. I hadn't applied for grad schools my senior year because my future had been so uncertain. I needed to figure out where I fit in. So after bouncing around a few jobs in Boston, I decided to take one of my Smith friends up on her offer of moving to Highlands, North Carolina to work for her aunt who owned a diner there and was always looking for help. A lot of my friends were skeptical of my plan. What was a gay Arab Muslim woman going to do in the South? <laughs> but I was willing to go anywhere and try anything to find my place. So I packed a bag and headed South. And when I arrived, Sarah Lee, yes, that's her real name, <laughs> gave me a job and welcomed me into her home. Sara Lee was a mix of Blanche from The Golden Girls and Julia Sugarbaker from Designing Women. <laughs> in other words, 100% perfect. And when I say I worked in her restaurant, I worked. I washed dishes and waited tables and bussed and cooked and cleaned, and I loved it. It was the therapy I needed to heal. I felt accepted and valued and like I was part of a team. I also felt like it wouldn't last. I was very nervous about coming out to Miss Sarah. After all, she was a Southern Baptist. But I had to tell her the truth. So one day, as we were watching TV in her living room, I said, Miss Sarah, you know that I'm gay. Her response is one that I will never forget. That's fine, honey. Just don't be a slut. <laughs> I know what it feels like to be valued and be accepted for who you are. This country gave me that. Smith gave me that. Miss Sarah gave me that. Miss Sarah and Dolly Parton did. About two years after coming out to her, I decided to move even further south to Atlanta. I was still... <laughs> I was still looking for my purpose. I waited tables, clerked for a law firm, did web and graphic design, and I even opened up a cafe. But none of it felt right. Then one day, driving to my favorite Middle Eastern grocery store, where I could get authentic hummus and pita bread, I took a wrong turn and ended up in a parking lot of a rundown apartment complex. I was in the middle of executing one of the world's worst three-point turns <laughs> when I noticed a group of kids playing soccer. They were barefoot and using rocks as goals. They were laughing and boasting and arguing about goals like kids do everywhere. They reminded me of home of the way I grew up playing soccer in the streets of Jordan with my brothers and cousins. A week later, I returned to the parking lot. This time, I was armed with a soccer ball. One of the boys ran up to me and asked if they could use it. I said yes, but only if they'd let me play. They were skeptical at first, but really wanted the nicer ball. <laughs> so they got in a huddle, talked amongst themselves, and eventually said, OK, you can play, but you're on their team. We played for hours, and I continued to leave work early every afternoon so that I could play with them. Eventually, I asked if any of them had ever played on a soccer team. They said no. I said, would you like to? Their response was a very loud yes. It took a fair bit of work, but eventually we formed a team. The Fugees was not your typical soccer team. Our players were from war-torn countries like Bosnia, Liberia, Sudan, and Afghanistan. The players were all, as our name suggested, refugees. The Fuji started small, but as word spread from friend to friend, from brother to sister, apartment complex to apartment complex, the team grew. Soon, I had dozens of kids asking to join. They wanted to play soccer, to be part of a team, to be surrounded, like others, to be surrounded by others like them. And we grew from one team to two to three. Belonging to a team made quiet kids loud. It made scared, scared kids brave. It helped kids who'd armored themselves with anger open up and laugh and smile. That was what being on a team did for them. But at the same time, but at the same time, my players were spending a lot of their time outside of soccer and school, a space where the opposite was true. 
One of my players, Minani from Burundi, described his first few weeks in American schools like this. On the first day of school here in the US, I felt isolated because I was different and new. I knew no English. The only word I knew was yes. I answered everything yes, and that got me in trouble. I was scared because I couldn't explain myself. I couldn't defend myself because I didn't know the language. Sometimes I would just cry because I felt weak and knew nothing about this new place. It is vitally important for us to understand that the kids I was coaching didn't choose to leave their homes. They did not choose to be victimized and traumatized. They didn't choose what age they were forced to leave their countries. The least we can do is welcome them with open arms. <clears throat> We love rags to riches stories, the narrative that says with hard work, anything's possible. But telling kids who've lost so much of their childhood to war, famine, and violence that if they really apply themselves, they can gain high school level proficiency in a matter of few months or years isn't just cruel, it's dishonest. I found that there's a lot of enthusiasm amongst funders and donors for secondary schools that are going against the grain and trying new things. People love innovation, as long as the rags to riches narrative doesn't change. As long as the story features a kid going from refugee camp to Harvard, or pulling themselves by their own frayed bootstraps. But real innovation takes imagination. It means questioning the status quo, it means being flexible, speaking up and shutting up, and above all, listening. When I realized my players aged 13 or 14 couldn't read or write, even though they'd been in a public school for two to three years, I did what any coach would do. Well, maybe what any coach should do. I started a school. This, <clears throat> this probably won't shock you. Starting school turned out to be a lot harder than starting a soccer team. <laughs> but just like the soccer teams, we started out small, six kids and one teacher in a church basement, and with a strong, dedicated, hardworking team, we grew slowly. Running a private school for refugee kids living below the poverty line is, as you can imagine, financially challenging. Even though I worked daily to raise money, there were limits to how much we could grow. During that time, I begged, borrowed, and ate a lot of ramen. I'll never forget meeting a 12-year-old boy named Emmanuel, whose family had fled had fled from the violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. When he enrolled in his local public school, he, looked, he took all the state tests and failed every single one of them. He only knew nine letters of the alphabet, six of which were in his name. They promoted him to the sixth grade. We didn't have space or the money to take more students, but Emmanuel's mom begged us to help him. She said she would cook and clean and even pay $100. She would do anything. So we took him in, but we couldn't take in every kid that wanted to come to our school. But the kids we could take were doing so well, outperforming their peers at other schools. They made, on average, 2.3 years of growth a year. They became more confident and were learning about their new home in a safe environment. <laughs> Our approach was working. We didn't expect a newly arrived refugee student who'd never learned how to read to perform at grade level. Instead, we'd meet them where they were and take the time to teach fundamentals and accelerate their learning. Arts and athletics are essential to our model. Every student learned to play an instrument, did art, learned yoga and martial arts, and every single kid played on a soccer team. And just like the soccer teams, we grew from six kids to 12 to 50 to 96. But after five years, we reached a financial crossroads. We decided to try to change the laws that restricted the school from getting the state funding it deserved. Everybody mobilized, board members, staff, and students. We spent two months meeting with state legislators in Georgia. In these meetings, I saw kids who'd once struggled to introduce themselves in English explaining in unbroken sentences how much our school meant to them. The bill unanimously passed out of committee. Then it passed the floor vote in the House. We were ecstatic. 
The Senate vote was the last hurdle we had to clear, and we hit a wall. The chairman of the Education Committee invited us to discuss some concerns that he had. We explained how the bill would ensure oversight, everything from reports to tracking students' progress to unscheduled site visits. Even with those in place, he didn't think the legislature should agree to fund our program forever. I told him I agreed. I showed him studies that demonstrated that it takes six to 10 years for someone to be academically proficient in a language. And I proposed that the bill be amended to cap the support at seven years. That's too long, he said. How about five years? Still too long. Three? The chairman leaned back in his chair, put his hands behind his neck, and said, I think it takes about one year to learn a language. I was dumbfounded. Then he leaned forward and said, you know, Muslims kill Christians every day. He refused to give us a hearing. We got so close, but the bill died in the Senate. But we refused to quit, and we kept going. Slowly, funders began to take notice. You couldn't really ignore our results. Our students made an average of 2.3 years of growth a year. They were confident in who they were. They were acclimating to their new home, and they were also dominating the soccer field. We opened up another school in Columbus, Ohio in 2018 and grew our Georgia school as a charter. The deep months of reflection that happened during the pandemic planted the seed of an idea that had been growing for years, as we asked ourselves not only what next, but what now? We could have opened more schools, but then what? We would have a sliver of the impact that we would do if we did something more radical. Our schools are incubators of innovation. Our model is proven, it works, but my vision is not opening more Fuji's academies in every resettlement community or state. Our vision is to change American education by taking everything that we've learned in the last 20 years and spreading it far and wide by partnering with school districts across the country. <laughs> by partnering with school districts across the country to implement our model. Ensuring that when kids who don't speak English arrive in a new city at a new school, they are welcomed with open arms. And they are welcomed with the Fuji's model, where they won't simply memorize a few English phrases and learn about American holidays. If this sounds like a lot of effort for a niche population, consider that by 2025, two years from now, a quarter of students in American public schools will speak a language other than English at home. Our new initiative, Project Taranga, the Senegalese word for community hospitality and belonging, will expand these partnerships across the country. Last year, we piloted this with Bowling Green Independent School Districts to open our first uh, Taranga Academy in Kentucky. The first public school partnership built by and for refugees and immigrants. It's based on our model. The program meets kids where they are. They start off their day with yoga or martial arts. Arts is a core subject, not an elective, and every single kid plays on a soccer team. In November, we anxiously awaited the data. But when it came, it surpassed all our expectations. 69% of the students had already surpassed their growth targets for the year. But more than that, the building felt like a community, like a family. The students' confidence showed as they were picking up chapter books, creating incredible pieces of art, and belting, we are a champion, at the top of their lungs. More than anything, Though, this showed us it wasn't the students who were failing, it was the system they were initially put in. <clears throat> I wanted to tell you all of this because it sums up so much of what I've learned about making change. Maybe some of this could help you too. First, remember why this work matters. This is what will keep you going. There have been a lot of moments throughout my career where I've been told no. There have been a lot of moments where I felt like the work was too hard, where I've considered giving up. And sometimes you do need to change direction or try something new. 
But for me, the thing that keeps me going, no matter what, is the core belief that my kids are capable, strong, and resilient. Think about it. For a kid who's been forced to leave their country, leave everything they know behind, and start over in a new place, learning a language is the easy part. A couple of years after the state senate stopped our bill, one of our students, Asa, a 13-year-old from Syria, had a panic attack in art class. He collapsed, crying on the floor, surrounded by his classmates. We brought him into my office, where he continued sobbing. They're all dead, he said. The night before, he'd received news that his family in Syria, including his grandmother, had been killed in a nighttime bombing. I told him we could take him home. He didn't have to stay at school. But he looked at me with more co conviction than I've ever seen from him, and he said, I want to stay here. I'm safe. Instead of going home, he asked if he could stay in the office for a while on the couch. And then at 4 p.m., we ran down to the field to join his team for practice. Belonging is what made it possible for our staff, our students, and our school to defy the odds. Yes, certain state senators might not have agreed that we deserve funding. Yes, we might have been running a school out of a rented church building with no financial reserves and some interesting issues with the plumbing at first. <laughs> yes, when we got started, every study and every piece of data said our students shouldn't be able to graduate. They shouldn't be able to complete high school. They'd live in poverty for generations. But millions of dollars and several years and a lot of ramen later, our approach is proven. That kids coming in at age 12 to 13 with limited or no formal education can, in the right environment, with the right approach, within three years, be at grade level with their peers. We've started a movement to radically redesign the education experience of English learners that is reaching kids nationwide, not just in Georgia and Ohio and Kentucky, but all over the country. Second, design for the solution, not for the funding, not for archaic guidelines and institutions. Don't be afraid to be a square peg. Be a square peg and build a square hole. When we designed the solution, we started by pursuing this out there idea of creating a new school. And we didn't have to do it the same way it's always been done. When I started the Fujis, I didn't have a degree in education, but I knew what it was like to learn a new language and what worked for me. I also knew what it was like to see the double takes people made when they realized I wasn't born here, or when they assumed that one of my parents must be a Westerner, or that I came to the US at a very young age. I grew up in a war zone, I had to leave my birth country, and I've had imposter syndrome. I valued fancy degrees, but at some point, I realized that my lived experience offered just as much, if not more, value. Over and over, I was told that soccer was just a nice to have, that art and music weren't essential, that kids had to be taught at the grade level they were at, and I should hire teachers who are used to teaching in community college or high-achieving schools. But I knew deep down that what we really needed were kindergarten teachers, teachers who knew how to meet kids where they were and teach them how to read. Over and over, I was dismissed because I was just a soccer coach, not an expert in education. But my beginner mindset helped me create a simple solution. My experience as a coach prepared me to lead teams, work through challenges, and solve problems. It taught me the importance of continuous improvement and setting the bar higher. From time to time, we all encounter people who don't see, this, who don't see the same value of a square peg. People like the state senator, who could sit across from me as someone who had sought asylum, someone who is bilingual, someone who worked every day with kids learning English, who'd just shown him the data about how long it takes to learn a new language and say that he thought it should just take one year. But this brings me to the final thing I want to share with you, which is always ask why and what next. I've heard you can't countless times, but I've also learned to change we can't until we can't yet. And whenever someone tells me we can't, I've learned to ask why. Always ask why and keep asking. So often I found that if someone tells you you can't and you ask them why, they won't be able to answer the question. 
When they do answer it, for example, when the answer is that there's some mandated requirement or some outdated law that is still on the books or some new law that just passed, that's a moment to get excited. Now you know the roadblock that you need to move out of the way. Why not change it? I had a light bulb moment years ago talking to an education attorney on our board about this. He told me, Luma, the law was made to be changed. For me, this is where so much of the joy and optimism that are so necessary to doing this work comes from. This is one of the many reasons why I believe in America and why I'm so happy that this is my home. I would never be able to do this kind of work in Jordan. I wouldn't be able to criticize a government that fails its citizens. I would be locked up for that. It's an incredible privilege and, a, and an expression of patriotism to be able to say this out loud. Our system is designed to fail students and we need to fix it. Like many people who come to this country, I fell in love with America through television, with a version of America that seemed so full of greatness. In many ways, America wasn't the land that I had been imagining all my life, or that I knew so many refugee families fantasize about during years of upheaval. But to me, it is still the greatest country on earth. It is a place... It is a place where we can take action pick up a soccer ball, and lead change. This might be the reason I created Fuji's family. Heartbreak, anger, and optimism are a very dangerous combination. And, <clears throat> starting to distract me, guys. Hold on. And because I owe my life to this nation, that's what I want to give it. Life is about learning and growing, adapting and changing, and fi figuring out how to make your next move. As my grandmother taught me, that starts with asking, what next? My grandmother was a refugee, too. She escaped Syria in 1964 after the first Assad regime took power. She was three months pregnant. She packed a suitcase, piled her five kids in the car, and drove the border into neighboring Jordan. My grandfather initially stayed behind because he didn't believe things would, it would get as bad as she feared. A month later, after his factory had been taken over by the government and his brothers tortured by the new regime, he followed his family to Jordan. My grandparents and their children had to start over building new lives from scratch in a new country where their future was uncertain. I was born 11 years later. To me, Jordan was home, but my grandmother wanted me to understand my family's journey in history I was only eight years old when she took me to visit my first refugee camp. I didn't understand why. I didn't know why it was so important for, uh, for her, for us to go. I remember walking into the camp, holding her hand, and her saying, go play with the kids. I didn't want to. These kids were poor. They were dirty. They weren't like me. They lived in a camp. I refused. She knelt down beside me and firmly said, go, and don't come back until you've played. Don't ever think people are beneath you or that you have nothing to learn from others. I reluctantly went. I never wanted to disappoint my grandmother. I returned a few hours later, having spent some time playing soccer with the kids in the camp. We walked out, and I was excitedly telling her what a great time I had and how fantastic the kids were. Haram, I said on the way home, thinking about the conditions in the camp. It means poor them in Arabic. Poor them for having to live like that. Haram on us, my grandmother said, using the word differently, that we were sinning. Don't feel sorry for them. Believe in them. It took many years and many thousands of miles of distance before I finally understood what she meant. Later that day, sitting at dinner in front of platters of kibben tabbouleh, I announced that I was going to give all my books and toys away to the kids in the camp. I expected my grandmother to be pleased. Instead, she asked, how is that going to help? It will make them feel good because they can read and play. It will make you feel good, my grandmother told me. They can't read if they don't go to school, and toys won't fix the problem either. 
then I'm going to fast until there aren't any more refugees, I declared. <laughs> You'll fast until the day you die, Lamnum, she replied. We need to stop these wars. This scene repeated throughout my childhood. When there's a cancer walk at our school and all the children got sign-up sheets to recruit sponsors to pledge money, no one asked me any follow-up questions until I took the forum to my grandmother. Does this money go directly to people with cancer, she asked. I don't know. They didn't tell us. And what next? What will you do once the walk is over? Charity, she taught me, was often one and done. Truly helping others meant making more than the occasional gesture. In a way, she was my coach, raising the bar, getting me to the next level. Shu Badin, what next? I wish I could tell her the stories that I told you about the Fujis. I wish you could see my students walk across the stage to accept their diplomas. I wish you could see the pride and relief in their parents' eyes when that happens. But I know what she would say. She would say that there's no time for despair or self-congratulations either. No time to stand still. Shubadin Habibti, she would ask. And now I ask you, what's next? And when we need a little extra inspiration, there's always Dolly Parton. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think we've got a couple of questions. Um, so the first question, for ESL teachers in the school, are you coming out with tools that can be adopted, or does this really have to be done at the district charter network net level? Um, I think there's actually a lot of great tools out there for ESL teachers, um, but what we've found is it needs to be the whole approach one tool isn't going to change anything. The culture of the school, of the program, has to include every aspect of our model. Um, and so we're developing like some free resources for teachers, like about backgrounds of the kids and the countries they're from. Some different religious observations that some of your students may celebrate, like country 101 sheets. Um, but in terms of tools, I know there's a lot of resources. We don't want to replicate those. We want, we want to change the entire approach and the mindset of doing this work. Um, so the next question is, do students, leave to go, do students leave to go into public schools at any point? And if so, what is their success rate? So Project Taranga, the program we piloted with Bowling Green is to, we, help them design their newcomer program. And students have up to three years to gain grade level proficiency, and after they do, they exit out and mainstream into their junior high or high school. So it's temporary, the program, but we're not throwing you back in just because you've done six months, right? Or a month in some cases. And so it's like once you're able to, you know, compete at the same level as your peers, and you're confident in who you are, you're ready to mainstream back in. Um, in our charter school, we ended up going to 12th grade because the school district we're in is um, it's not very good. Um, and initially, we mainstreamed back in, but then um, we saw all the work that we did. Um, just, it, it was terrible. And so the parents asked if we could grow into a high school. Our high school is much more traditional than our um, first three-year model. Um, can you expound on why arts and athletics are essential for student success? I agree, but I would love to hear your thoughts. So I'm glad you agree, because <laughs> not everybody agrees with that. Um, there's study after study shows arts and athletics do incredible work in healing trauma. Arts and athletics are multisensory, so you don't need a language to participate in them. Um, you can create incredible pieces of art without knowing a word of English. 
um, singing. How many of you know this fact? Um, how many of you know ABBA? That's showing how old I am. Okay, great. So a uh, Swedish band, they didn't know how to speak English. But when you hear their songs, you wouldn't know that because singing teaches tone, inflection, pronunciation, confidence, right? I start off my day every morning with a song. It gets me in a good mood. We want to talk about creating a place that kids feel like they belong and that they have success throughout their day. These are subjects where they can. Um, being on a team is one of the most powerful experiences one can have. You don't have to be an athlete, but being around others like you and you're all working together to win a game and you go through losses and wins, it's one of the most powerful tools schools should have. Um, and so that's why I think it's essential. There's also tons of uh, research papers out there about brain development with the arts. And I guess our policymakers ignore that because that's the first thing they slash. Um, but yeah, it's not um, once or twice a week. It is every single day for our students. How do you cultivate the culture of your school? Can you share actionable steps? How would you approach people who are resistant to creating an inclusive space? I think that's one of the, when we explain our model, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's segregation. And it is in a way. We're segregating the students temporarily for them to feel safe, for them to feel academic success, and for them to be ready to mainstream back in. You can't throw someone into the ocean when they don't know how to swim. They need to be around others like them to learn the basics and learn how to swim, and then we won't have so many people drowning every day. Um, we see success in women's colleges and HBCUs where that space is super important for people. Yet, for English language learners across the country, we're so scared of doing it. And I don't know why. Kid after kid speaks of their first experience in the United States as traumatic that they're made fun of, that they just nod and say yes, kind of like the way some of you did when I started teaching Arabic. <laughs> That's not the way to welcome them in. We need places where we can explain this new country to them. There are some things about American culture that are very bizarre. <laughs> like, I remember one year we were taking, uh, we take the kids trick-or-treating for Halloween, and there's a new kid that just arrived from Afghanistan, and he came downstairs and we're all like painting our faces and getting dressed and he's like, what's going on here? <laughs> we're like, it's Halloween, we're gonna dress up as like uh, scary monsters and we're gonna go knock on doors and get candy. <laughs> and he's like, what? I was like, just follow us. We went trick-or-treating in this beautiful neighborhood. And then at the end, you know, uh, he comes to the bus and he's like, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, he said, what time coach? And I said, what? He said, what time tomorrow? And I'm like, we don't have a game tomorrow. What are you asking? And he's like, no, what time are we going trick-or-treating tomorrow? <laughs> it's like, why can't we go trick-or-treating every, every day, right? Um, even some of the foods here are very different than the foods we're used to abroad. Some of the family structure, uh, what you eat with, a lot of us eat with our hands. Um, I remember when I first came to the US, um, I didn't know what double dipping was. So Arabs, most of us don't know what double dipping is, right? Because we dip into each other's plates, we eat. And I was out with a group of friends, there's chips and salsa, and I double dipped. <laughs> and everybody stopped eating. <laughs> and no one told me what was wrong. And I was like, oh, this is really good, you guys should try it, and I kept double dipping. And then later on, one of my friends explained it to me. And it's like, I was embarrassed. Uh, I can laugh about it now, but like, why can't we take time to teach people so they don't get humiliated or bullied or made fun of? That we truly make the welcome mat a little longer, a little softer, and a little gentler. Um, 
Is it possible to restructure our public schools to welcome and meet newcomers where they are? Are, are charter and alternative schools the only way? So I would say yes. So our partnership with uh, Bowling Green Independent School District, they're a public um, district in Bowling Green, and we're implementing our model as a program in their district. Um, but all the, all the things had to be in place. So I remember when we were explaining our model, um, I said, you need to find your best kindergarten teachers for the kids that are coming in at level one. And they're like, well, we can't. I was like, why? And they're like, well, kindergarten teachers aren't allowed to teach kids not in elementary school. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, because that's when kids learn to read. And I was like, well, if you're coming in at 12 or 13, you don't know how to read. Why aren't we putting reading teachers in front of the, these kids? And so they went and asked for a waiver from the state. And they got it. You know, and I think they had hit rock bottom where they saw like nothing they were doing was changing the trajectory of their English language learners, nothing. They had tried everything. And so they wanted to try something new and it pushed their comfort zone, but they're seeing the results. We're all seeing it and we hope what we're learning in Kentucky improves our next cohort and the cohort after that. What is next for our organization? Uh, what partner schools are you expanding to? Um, so we're expanding into a district in Ohio, in Ohio and we're securing one more. Um, I can't name it yet because it's an RFP thing that, why do we have those? So um, it takes so long and you're like, we need to do this a little bit more quickly, but it's okay. Um, and so we'll be announcing those in May and so we'll have two more districts that we do this with, and the following year we're gonna be securing four more districts after that, so. <laughs> we're growing slowly because our approach is, is time intensive. It's not like a quick playbook and a checklist. It's you have to change the way you think about education, the way you think about your community. Um, that culture, creating a good school culture is more important than good academics. Oh, only a few claps, but yep, soon. Um, so how do you deal with students who don't recognize the needs of your students due to bias? Have you had to explain the bias to your students? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of people that um, don't understand our community. Um, you know, some, I would say, they're just not aware of the issue. Um, but some are, are bigoted, you know, it runs the whole spectrum. Um, so our job is to educate and explain. Um, we don't ever want to put a kid in a position where they have to explain themselves, their background, their religion, their home. That's the adult job. Um, but then like outside of the bubble, they'll experience it. I remember one of uh, our games, we're playing in, um, there's two stories. We were playing a, a game, one of my co-ed teams, and one of the girls wore hijab, um, and I saw her start losing her temper during the game. And so I pulled her out, and I said, what did that kid say to you? And this was at the height of the Trump administration, um, and she refused. I was like, what did he say to you? And she's like, still refused. And I said, did he call you a terrorist? And she's like, how did you know? And I said, because I get called that a lot too. And I said, you need to ignore him. You need to walk away. Um, there are lots of people in this country that love you for who you are and where you're from. And if they're haters, you just need to ignore them. You need to silence them. You need to mute them. It's easier to say. Um, but when you really want to win a game, it's easier to do. Um, but we're continuously teaching our kids about it. You can't avoid it. It's in the media, it's in the grocery store. And for them to hold their head up, up high and be proud of who they are, um, when people make fun of that they don't know how to speak perfect English, 
I was like, why don't you ask those people if they know how to speak another language? And then why don't you ask, have you ever been forced to leave your country and start in somewhere so unfamiliar, right? Like our community has superpowers that the majority of this room does not have. How can we join and help your programs? So I have to say you can donate. <laughs> um, you can spread the word in your school districts. Um, if you feel that your district or your community is ready for something like this, we're currently vetting districts for the 2024 cohort. Um, and we'll be hiring a lot of people in the next few years. So those of you with a refugee and immigrant background, please check our careers page regularly. Um, what is the first step a school leader can do to enact change for newcomer students on their campus? So I think one easy step, first impressions are important, okay? Miss Sarah welcomed me into her house, into her community. That is always gonna be my memory of America. Everything that I hear and experience elsewhere, I go back to my first experience. If your first experience is strong and loving and humane, it will get you through so much. So instead of when a newcomer comes in, you walk them down the hall and they're like 14 or 15 and drop them off in geometry class and say, okay, good luck. Take time to talk to them. Give them a tour of the school. Middle and high schools, are in they're intimidating. Like, I get lost in them. Show them where the restroom is. Walk them through the cafeteria line. Match them up with a buddy in their class. It's things that are simple. It's like, how do we treat each other better? More humanely, more kindly. Um, and then teach your entire staff how to do it like that as well. Um, our families immediately motivated and engaged with the program. How, how to design engaging approach strategies to different families and cultures. Um, I'd say it's a mix. I'd say the majority of families are motivated and engaged. Um, for some, it takes a while because they're skeptical. They're like, what is going on here? Um, and then how do you celebrate every culture, right? And that is a wonderful opportunity because if you celebrate every culture, you're gonna have some kind of party every week. <laughs> and then everybody feels included, everybody feels valued. We celebrate every religious holiday we do, Eid and Christmas and Holy and some of the Buddhist uh, holidays and Jewish holidays. You celebrate everything that is in your building and it's incredible, because you get to learn about each other. Um, when I was in elementary school, I went to a British uh, school, um, so that's why my English is so decent. Um, and I was in, in the Christmas play, <laughs> and I was the camel. <laughs> they didn't stereotype, I'm telling you. Um, and I was supposed to take the three kings to uh, see Mary and, and baby Jesus. And the Christmas play coincided with Eid, the big Muslim holiday at the end of uh, Ramadan. And so our family usually goes away for two to three days to Aqaba or Petra. And so my parents were like telling us about this and I was like, I can't go, I'm in the Christmas play. <laughs> and my dad's looking at me, he's like, what? I was like, I'm a camel, I'm taking the three kings, it's about Jesus, you know this story. <laughs> and he's like, what is happening to my child, right? But I got to learn about how some of my classmates celebrated. It didn't take away anything from my Muslim identity, right? It just taught me what others that sit next to me experience. Um, food is also a great way of bringing people together, right? Food and sport and art are the safest and easiest ways to bring people together. And so there's some kind of regulation about potlucks in public schools if someone can figure that out, it's gonna save me a lot of time and energy. <laughs> um, all right, so my last question is, <laughs> I don't wanna 
<laughs> How have you uh, built your sustainability plan to continue this work when you step away? I get asked that a lot. Um, it's, it's hit by a bus. Sometimes people put it like more cra in a crass way. What is going to happen when you get hit by a bus? Um, hopefully, I won't get hit by a bus. But we're building out our team. Um, you know, I'm I'm approaching the age where the baton needs to be handed to the next generation. Um, we're hoping to see a lot of our alums engage in this work. Um, and so we're building the pipeline to ensure that it happens. And I mean, one person can't do all this work, all right? So I know I'm like front and center, but I have an incredible team that works behind the scenes and in front of districts that makes sure that we're doing this work well. Um, so that's, I think that answers it, kind of. So thank you. I was told this was my last question. Um, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>